spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, right. he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now, so when we come to chapter 8, we'll do a little bit of review. We want to remember, Paul is talking to saved people in the passage. Yes. He's already determined in Romans 5, your eternal security. He's not dealing with unsaved people here. He's dealing with saved people. So we want to remember that when we're, when we're looking at these verses. That condemnation in verse 1 is not going to hell. That condemnation is the condemnation of Romans 7, 24, of trying to please God in the flesh and the result of that is, oh, wretched man that I am. I had an interesting conversation with somebody while I was on vacation last week about the definition of grace. And one of the things, as the conversation went to some places, one of the things that, that I was able to, to relate to this person is that, oh, woeful man that I am, that depression, that self-defeating, self-loathing guilt that we all get, it ends up in depression addiction, bitterness, suicides, those things. And the Christian life's not meant to be lived that way. That's right. Christian life is, should be a life of victory through Jesus Christ, not through anything you do in your flesh. Uh, there's, there's somebody out there teaching right now that the judgment seat of Christ is not for the, the church of body of Christ because when we get there, there there's not going to be any judgment, uh, any reward for something you've done in your flesh. Well, first of all, it's a complete misunderstanding of what the judgment seat of Christ is. But... The point is, yeah, there is no glory in anything that we do in our flesh. Our labor in the Lord, our labor walking by the Spirit, is what the reward is based on, not anything that we've done. So we want to make sure that we, hey guys, we want to make sure that we understand why, um, well, what he's talking about, that condemnation in verse 1. It's not going to hell, It's two, there's a two-part thing there. There's no condemnation, you got to be saved. Right, that's, that's the first thing you see that for those that are in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit not after the flesh but after the spirit the issue there is if you want to stay away from that that self-loathing guilt that I have failed God again I'm trying to do the right thing and I just can't walk after the spirit not after the flesh and we looked last time if you remember about these issues of don't receive the grace of God in vain don't frustrate the grace of God. These are all things he tells a believer they can do. They can receive the grace of God in vain. They can frustrate the grace of God. They can be fallen from grace, and they can grieve, and we're, not, we're told not to grieve, to grieve not the Holy Spirit. Now again, these are not things that are to tell you to hell, would, would send you to hell. When you receive God's grace in vain, it's when you put yourself back under the law. I keep looking at you guys, and I keep thinking about Hawaii with this cold weather. <laughs> so if I stutter for a moment, I'm just getting my bearings. <laughs> when you frustrate the grace of God, you start living like you're not who you are. You like, start living like you're under Israel's program, like you're out there working, striving, toiling to show how, God, how great you are so that maybe God will give you some favor in your life. That's how you frustrate the grace of God. Fallen from grace. When you live according to the law, when you put yourself back under the law, you have fallen from grace. You haven't lost your salvation. That's already a settled issue. You're not living like who you are. There's a grace life. When you put yourself back under the law, you've fallen from that grace life, which is what we saw in Romans 7 with Paul. And the last one, grieve not the Holy Spirit. That's over in Ephesians. And it's just, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. There, you know, there's that teaching out there that, well, the Holy Spirit can't be resisted. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches the Holy Spirit can be resisted. One of the, when we, you grieve the Holy Spirit, specifically in, in two ways, they're both kind of the same. One, by living under the law, but also by living like who you're not. Well, and, and denying the truth of the uh, verse. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 
when, when, you, when you are out living like other Gentiles, like the unsaved world, you grieve in the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit just doesn't want you doing that. But when you put yourself back under the law, you're, doing, you're grieving the Holy Spirit too, because as we've seen, the verse says, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. That's right. It's already, that's, a, that's an issue of state, not standing. Romans 6 tells us we're not under the law anymore, right? Romans 6, 14. Since you'll not have dominion over you. Why? For you're not under, under the, the law, law but, under, but grace. under grace. Again, that, that verse where he says, if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, that's like almost a self-check. If you find yourself living legalistically, living under the law, living under a self-prescribed performance-based acceptance system, it's not the Holy Spirit that took you there. It's your own flesh that took you there. And I know that's, that can be hard for us, right? We like to think that, well, of course I did what the Spirit wanted to. But if it's a performance-based acceptance system, it's not by the Spirit. Because we're already accepted by Jesus Christ. Right, exactly. So we got to remember, in Romans 8, the issue is walking after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Which is very interesting, because now we're back in Galatians, just like we were in Romans 7. That book of Galatians is, a, is an important book when it comes to Romans 7 and Romans 8. So we looked at those issues. So now we're done in, in Romans uh, 8, verse 6. Well, verse four, first four or five. Jesus Christ, in verse three, Jesus Christ came. He condemned sin in the flesh. What does that mean? Well, when we do our three circles, right? When you're born, your spirit, soul, and body. What the Bible calls this body of sin. When you believe the gospel, you were crucified with Christ. Okay, you were this connection between you, your soul, and your body of sin was broken. There's a, there's a circumcision made without hands, the cutting off of the flesh. You no longer have to obey that body of sin. When you were unsaved, you had to. Okay? You don't have to do that anymore. When Jesus Christ died on that, that cross, he condemned that sin. When you, then it gets applied to you when you believe the gospel. Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. At that moment, that sin in your body is condemned. It, has, it, it no longer has power over you. Now, we let it have power over us. But this event happened, your old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we should not serve sin. So that, that's what it means when he says Jesus Christ came and he condemned sin in the flesh. Now why did he do that? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. He repeats what he said in verse 1. The righteousness of the law is what we need. The question is, well, why does the righteousness of the law need to be fulfilled in us if we're not under the law? That's a reasonable question. But why does the righteousness of the law need to be fulfilled in us? Because we are short, become short of the glory of God. How do you get to heaven? You've got to live that perfect, you be righteous. That, that, that perfect righteous life, right? You need perfect righteousness to get to heaven. We don't have it, do we? No. Thank goodness. Praise the Lord, literally. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, took care of that issue. But when you come to Romans 8, again, we're not, it's not, this is not a salvation verse we're talking about here. This is the issue of our walk, what we call our state. There's a standing in state. Standing before God. We are, look, up, look over at 2 Corinthians 5. We'll come right back to Romans 8. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When God looks down upon us, he does see us as righteous in his son. Yeah. Right. When God looks down and sees Dave, he sees him through the complete, perfect, total righteousness of his son because I'm in Christ. Right. Now that verse there also is about your state. But what I want you to see is, see that because we can't live a life pleasing to God if that sin issue in our life is not taken care of first. That sin issue has to be taken care of first. Jesus Christ took care of that sin issue at the cross. To use a word that Paul uses, we need to reckon it so also. So often we don't, we don't believe the verse. And we believe the verse, but we don't believe it in an application. We don't believe sin doesn't have dominion over us. We don't believe that sin issue was truly taken care of by Jesus Christ. We've been removed clearly from the penalty of sin, right? That happened at your salvation. We will be removed from the presence of sin someday at the rapture. But today, as we live, we've been re removed from the power of sin. 
if we'll believe the verse, the word of God works effectually in you that believe. Do you or do you not believe, and this is rhetorical, <laughs> that, that, that sin issue's been taken care of in your life? And I understand that's a minute, that can be a tongue as a minute by minute declaration, right? And hey, this thing's going on, it doesn't have, have power over me. So we need that righteousness of the law. We need that perfect righteousness. And we have it in Christ. Look back at Romans 8. He says in verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Okay, Jesus Christ took care of the sin issue, condemned sin in the flesh. That sin in your flesh doesn't have power over you anymore because of the cross work of Christ. Not because of anything you did. You believe the gospel and you got it applied to you. But the work was done by Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, now that that's been happened, you can be made the righteousness of God. Now this is a state issue now. This is your walk he's talking about. For your standing, it's happened. Before God, you are righteous, but there's your state. Is what this verse is talking about. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. How do we get the righteousness of the law to be fulfilled in us? By toiling hard? No, we follow the Holy Spirit. Working really hard? No. Walking not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Thinking about things the way God would think about them. Now, how does that work? I mean, it's really easy to say here on a Sunday morning on a beautiful, wonderful, 85 degree day out, 43 and raining day outside. <laughs> to just say, well, let's just walk after the Spirit. Go out and be happy. But how do you do that? How do you do that in the circumstances and the details and the nitty gritty issues of where we live our life? The COVID thing, the, the, the political unrest, the, the ice storm, the, the snowstorm, the 65 and blue sky. Anyhow, how do you do that? <laughs> you understand that your old man has been crucified when you got saved. You don't have to serve that thing anymore. You now have a relationship, if you can, with your spirit. Your spirit was dead. You got saved. It was made alive. Your Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, rightly divided, renews your spirit day by day. And then the circumstances of life, you make a decision. What are you going to do? Are you going to walk after the flesh? Or are you going to walk after the spirit? Are you going to walk after what the Lord has taught you through his spirit, through the word of God, dealing with the circumstances of life? Or are you going to deal with it according to what you think is proper? Oops. And I'm assuming nobody's going to say, well, I'm going to go do this because this is evil. And it just, I think what most of us like want to do is, well, I know what's right, so I'm just going to do that. But that's relying on our flesh. Right. That's relying on our flesh. We need to look at a situation the way the Holy Spirit tells us to look at the situation. It tells us how to deal with our parents, our children, our workers, our bosses, fellow members of the Church of Body of Christ, unsaved people. You know what he tells you? I mean, we, we don't think about this way. You know what Paul tells you? If a man's a heretic after the first or second time, do you baptize the person? That's it. We, we just want to keep coming back. Don't we? We'll just keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a role for that there. But Paul tells you after the second or third time, first or second time, if a man's a heretic, you know. Don't get into these end. <laughs> Here it is. Don't get, you know what Paul's telling you? Don't get on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> So glad I have stayed. I have not stayed out of the political arguments, but I have stayed out of the spiritual arguments. And I watch. And you know what? You watch a spiritual argument happen on Facebook, and it, it could be anywhere else. It could be the town square. But you know what? There's nothing godly or edifying about any of those things. They just deteriorate into name calling and 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 bad doctrine and, and all those things. Because that's not the issue. The issue is what would the spirit have you to understand? Well, understanding too. This is what the Bible says: is that. Um, tribulation with its patience and patience experience and experience hope that we may not be ashamed. The most, yeah. the, 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 the most important part of what you just said is what the Bible says. Right. That's how we understand what the Spirit wants us to do. Not because, well, the Spirit spoke to us. I was moved. I got a funny feeling in my tummy. No. The 
Holy Spirit talks to you through the Word of God right here tonight. Yeah, but a lot of, yeah, that's the key is that a lot of people say that the Bible says this and the Bible says that, but, you know, they could be quoting all sorts of things out of context that's that right. wrong, or in the wrong, um, in the wrong and dispensation. It's exactly right. And, and so I think that I see a base of, of that's where a lot of the spiritual arguments come from, yes. is that people are speaking, that they're talking about things that have nothing to do COVID is the mark of the, the, the vaccine's the mark of the beast. I've actually seen mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I don't think so. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, that was the main point. I don't know if it came through, but that was really the main point of what I taught Saturday at the conference. Can you keep what? repeat what you Oh, said. yeah. The, 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 you know, we, we talked about Facebook, and I don't mean to speak for Jenny, but I think we would both kind of agree we have a Facebook problem. <laughs> so, so when I say that, I can, I'm talking about myself too. But, but you know, that, that's kind of where the town square is today. You know, you used to go down and debate on Mars Hill, right, or in Portland down in Portland's living room, whatever you call it downtown. Now it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Twitter or whatever it is. And people get on there and they have the discussions. And what they do though is they don't understand the word of God rightly divided. So one, they're either they're, they're quoting stuff the Bible doesn't even say. Or they're quoting stuff that's not, that's not to you. You know, the thing I talked about on Saturday was the thing over in Second Chronicles. If my people called by my name will humble themselves. Turn. If you go back and read that verse and try it to the, the and if you take Second Chronicles 7 and apply it to the church of the body of Christ, it is the exact opposite of what Paul's telling you to do here. Everything in that verse is, if they'll humble, I will forgive. If they'll turn back to me, I will heal, heal their land. That is the very definition of a performance-based acceptance system. That's the very definition of law living. But if you meet somebody with that and you're, you get the... You know, yeah, you become a heretic, don't you? Well, that's yeah. Cur yeah, cursing yeah. and blessings. Because, you know, Paul to Timothy says those people that oppose themselves, sound doctrine will, will, will be... Second Timothy. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God of peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover, listen to it, themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Okay, when you, you're a member of the church of body of Christ, you're under grace, not under the law. Paul's writing to Timothy, who runs the church at, at, at Ephesus. How would somebody oppose himself if they're a member of the church of body of Christ? They would live like the unsaved, one, or they would put themselves back under the law. Now, Satan can't do anything about it. Satan has a will for your life. He can't do anything about your salvation. But he can sure make you live or encourage you to live like who you're not, like a, an unsaved person. And he's also okay if you live back under the law. He just doesn't want you operating as who you are, member of the church of the body of Christ. What Paul tells Timothy there is the answer to that is sound doctrine. Now, sound doctrine, Paul describes it as what's been relayed to him. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. What, what he says is, you know what? Sound doctrine will allow people to recover themselves out of this bad thinking. Sound doctrine is the answer. You know, we don't like to admit that. We want there to be some other thing. Sound doctrine, the word of God rightly divided. Did you know that there's one Bible, there's one verse in your Bible that tells you to study? Yeah, there is. One. And that same verse tells you how to study it? Isn't that something? Look over at 2 Timothy. I guess you're already in 2 Timothy. <laughs> Second Timothy 2 and verse 15. This is where you, this verse only makes sense in the King James Bible. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All the new versions say rightly handling, and it's not rightly handling. It's dividing. That word in the original Greek, and you guys know how often I do that, not very often, is a clear, concise cut, a dividing. You understand, he says, he doesn't say rightly dividing truth from error. Rightly dividing the word of truth. The whole Bible's the truth. But you need to rightly divide exactly what Jenny's saying. 
We need to understand who you are. Do we use the whole Bible? Well, we know anybody that comes to this room or on the uh, truck stop knows we're all over the place. Because this is who you are. Now, we don't walk like we're... Would it be a... Let me ask you, would it be a walk of faith for an Israelite, a Jew, not today, but back here, to say, I understand what the law says, but I'm just going to appeal to God's grace. I'm not going to do the law because I know God is gracious. That would not be a walk of faith, would it? No. And remember when Paul gets stoned, he's killed, he goes into the third heaven? He says, I heard words that were unlawful for a man to utter. That, those are the words. It's not some secret. The words are, he, he learned grace words. Though, what, that example I just gave was unlawful. It would not be right for them to say that back then. Now, it was God's grace that always saved them, but in accordance with them performing. For us, it's just the opposite. It's not a walk of faith to walk according to the law. And I know we think it, we think it is. We think it is. So we, well, well, I'm going to go show God how good I am. Hey, God knows you can't do it. That's why he sent his son. That's right. That's why he sent his son. So the issue now is walking after the Spirit. And again, how do you do that? Through that book, the Holy Spirit, I believe the outer man perish, the inner man's renewed what? Day by day. Day by day. <clears throat> Not Sunday by Sunday, day by day. A consistent intake of the Word of God, rightly divided, gets into your spirit, into your mind, into your thinking. You pray about those words. You study those words. You meditate on those words. You think about those words. You know, you think about what Israel was to do. Write it on the, all over the house. Wear it on their forehead. Write it. You need to have that attitude towards the Word of God. Well, when the circumstances of life come, you do what the Word of God says, not what the Word of David says. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sword of the Spirit. Sword of the Spirit. Walk after the Spirit. Well, how do I know what the Spirit says? He wrote you a book. <clears throat> We like to make it this metaphysical, new agey type thing, but it's not. And it's empowering. Yes, it is. Well, you're saying we need to go check the book every time. No, hopefully you mature. Over there, in, look at Hebrews 5. Of course, the book of Hebrews is written to that little flock going through the tribulation. But there's a wonderful, wonderful thing he says here about, about the Word of God. Hebrews 5. In verse 13. I just love, I, I love this, the, the phraseology here. Verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now it's okay to be a babe in Christ, right? That's what he called the Corinthians. Now he used it there, attacking them because he'd already been there almost two years. They shouldn't have been babes in Christ, right? right. But everybody's a babe in Christ at some point, right? The day you get saved, you don't know anything, but you're just not going to hell. You got your fire insurance and you're good to go. Okay. But then but you're a babe. You're unskillful in using the word, and that's okay. But then you need to go on and mature. And we'll look at this verse in a short time in our Hebrew study. But look what he says. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. He's talking about good, sound, solid doctrine. People that are able to use the word of God correctly. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, first thing you need to understand in the Bible, in the King James Bible, the word evil doesn't mean really, really bad. It just means not good. Okay, we have different levels. We have good, we have good, bad, really bad, evil. That's not the way, but the Bible has good and has evil. So, now, what he's talking about here, though, is as you mature, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. As you go through life, you rely on the word of God. Your senses are exercised. You see, and boy, it works. If you never have a reason to put the word of God to test and see if it works, is it ever going to be alive in your life? No. It can't be. Well, like um, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, that's, that's a really good one. Yeah, you're in Hebrews. Look over at Hebrews 4. 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Now, sometimes that word quick in the Bible means alive. Here it means fast. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than two any two-edged sword, piercing even to the deciding, 
dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Let me stop right there. Soul and spirit and joints of marrow. You see how that verse right there takes us all the way back to our three circles. Mm -hmm. And it divides us. It, it lets you know where your problem is, if I can put it that way. Uh, piercing even to the dividing is under soul and spirit, under the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why we don't like the Bible. That's why people don't like, not we, but that's why people don't like the Bible. It lets you know what's going on in your heart. Yes, it does. You know what Jeremiah say? The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the next verse says, well, I can know it. I can know it. Ooh, that's my view. I said that it's quick. The Word of God works fast. It's not something you have to study your whole life just to find a little nugget. I, I, nugget. I have, uh, adjure you to, I beseech you to study the Bible your whole life. But you know what? If you were the, if you have something going on and you want to know an answer to it, you get in that in about 20 minutes at that Bible of diligent study, you can get the answer. It's quick. Now, we don't like the answer a lot of times. I get that. I'll give you my example. About a year ago, I got in that thing at work. And I, for three days, I looked at that verse about forgiving others for a loophole. It's not there. <laughs> you can forgive others. But it's quick. It's fast. It will divide us under. Is it a, is it a spirit thinking? Is it a body? Is it, is it a spirit problem? Is it a body problem? Is it a thinking problem? Are you walking after the flesh? And it'll do it quick. If we'll listen to it, it'll do it quick. And you know what you're talking about? Your senses are exercised. Okay, the circumstances of life have happened. I've relied on myself and I've relied on the Bible in two different times. And you know what? When I read, as you do that and you rely on the Bible and you find, wow, what Paul said 2,000 years ago still really does work. What the Holy Spirit wrote through the pen of Paul 2,000 years ago, it still works in the year 2021. I don't know if you guys paid it, watched it all on Saturday, but the, my lesson on Saturday, I spent a lot of time going back to the verses where Paul talks about the day in which he lived. Yeah. He calls it the present evil world, the present distress. He tells Timothy in the latter times, it, it's going to wax worse and worse. Paul did not live in a good time. I asked the question, whether or not you're for Trump or for Biden, do you think either one of them was as bad as Nero? And that's who, that's who the, the, the ruler was when Paul was on the planet, yeah. was Nero. And what did Paul say? You know, we don't need to, I don't want to go down that path right now. But the Bible will tell you how to deal with these issues. The Bible is still just as relevant today in the year 2021 as it was back when Paul finished the Bible when he wrote 2 Timothy in probably 64. For all the things that we go on, you can rely on that. When he says, if you want to please God, if you want the righteousness of the law fulfilled in you, you need to walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. It's just as true today as it was when Paul wrote it. That's right. And, of course, when Paul wrote it, who really wrote it? The, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So now we're back here, aren't we? The Holy Spirit renewing your spirit. And that you, this, is the, this is the renewing of your mind. This is the renewed thinking. And like I said, you make a decision. This isn't, you, know, you just don't sit there, grab your Bible, and give it a good hug, and say, okay, God, zap me. And everything's going to be unicorns and rainbows. Whatever it is. It'll walk, you'll walk after the Spirit. I'm going to go Romans. Now the reason for that, the reason that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in you is, is because it happens when you walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. It's because the flesh and the Spirit are at odds with each other. That's right. Look at verse 5. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now again, I mean, it, it's true of the unsaved, right? If you're caught up in a sin and all you think about is that sin, that's where you're going. Yeah. Okay, but that, that, that's clear. And he's talking to saved people here. He's, and don't forget the context of, of Romans chapter 7 is he's trying to please God. Okay? He says, if, if, if you're after the flesh, if you're trying to do it in your flesh, you're just going to mind the things of the flesh. That's all you're going to do. Right. That's where you're fine. Well, if I do this, God will be happy with me. Well, the biggest issue there right off the top is what? Pride. 
I can do it. I can do what Jesus Christ didn't do on the cross. Whoa. We don't want to think about it like that, do we? <laughs> Sometimes in our actions, when we put words to our actions to describe our own actions, and I'm talking to myself here. Um, you guys, we've done this before, but look over at Galatians 5. You've heard me say it a million times, I'm going to say it a million more. When you come to the book of Galatians, you're talking, Paul is talking to people that started out great, and they want to go on to please God. Somebody's come, by, come in, the Judaizers have come in, and told them, okay, you're saved, that's great, now you need to go do the law. Okay, there's not the Corinthians that got saved under Roman care. These are people trying to live a life pleasing to God. So when we come to Galatians 5, the whole issue has been walking after the Spirit, not after the earth, why you can't be made perfect under the law. And he's going to say some things about the flesh here. What we need to understand is these are people trying not to do the very things he's describing. These are not evil people. He's not telling them, well, quit thinking about sin because you just, you just be a sinner. He's telling them, quit trying to do it in your own flesh because if you do, this is what happens. So with that in mind, read this. Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, Walk in the spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Remember when we were in Romans 7, Paul said, I want to do this and I can't. Right. I don't want to do this and I do. That's that verse. The spirit and the flesh lust against each other. If you're trying to do something, that, and I, this is a, a, a statement that hurts my pride. If you're trying to do something in your flesh, it will not do what the Spirit wants. That's right. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. Yep. And I like to think, well, my flesh knows what the Spirit wants to do. But that's not true. That's not what this verse says. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and what? They yeah. are contrary. contrary, so you cannot do the things that you would. Uh, verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit... You are not under the law. Again, that's not a salvation verse. That's an issue of your, your state. If you find yourself under the law, it wasn't the Spirit there that put you there. If you're walking after the Spirit, you're not going to be under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, bareness, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such. Of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He's telling them, when you try to do live a life pleasing to God in your own flesh, that's the result. In Romans 7, remember he said, I had a lust, I had it, I didn't know not to covet, but I found a law that said, Don't lust. Tried to apply that law, and it worked all manner of concupiscence. It went from one issue to all manner of one issue, because the flesh and the spirit aren't compatible. They are, in fact, contrary one to another. So we'll go back to Romans, Romans 8. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Okay. Well, if minding, walking after the flesh, minding the things of the flesh is the result, then walking after the spirit is going to be minding the things of the spirit, right? If you're after the flesh, if you're concerned, if you're trying to do it, whatever you can in your flesh, the result is going to be the things that the flesh do. And we just saw what they do over in Galatians. But if you mind the things that are of the spirit, if you're after the spirit, you're going to be minding the things of the spirit. And that's the mindset change. Instead of saying, well, what can my flesh do? What does the Spirit want me to do in this situation? And I will tell you this, very personal note. There's been many times in my life when I knew I did the right thing until I found the verse that told me I did not. That hurt. There are things that I've done that I'm like, well, hey, I'm, I'm sure that was in the will of God. And you get it, you're probably reading it. Read it now. Because we think about things one way. The Spirit thinks about things another way. Again, the flesh and the spirit are contrary one to another. 
If you're walking after the Spirit, if you're doing a daily intake of the Word of God rightly divided, what are you going to be thinking about? The things of God. Reading? The things that you've been reading. Basically, if I can uh, understand, well, straight things so it's, up. not um, Bring the gospel to the metaphysical kind of stuff. It's basically reading the word and following what the word says, and that's living after the spirit. Exactly. You, you, exactly. It's what she said. Is it's not this metaphysical thing that's out there somewhere that we. We, we try to figure out what it is. It's just responding to a situation the way the written word of God has told us. If you were to just go study Paul's epistles, you know the vast majority of what Paul tells you is how to live your lives. How to live a life pleasing to God. How are you supposed to relate to the circumstances of life? But he doesn't put it down like, okay, when A happens, do B. He says, Deal with your employees as if they're the Lord. They're not. But if Jesus was working for you, how would you treat them? If Jesus was your boss, how would you respond? Work heartily as if working unto the Lord. Yeah, work unto the Lord. Understand, it's not what our will to be. The thing about we talk so much in this room too about the faith of Christ. Ultimately, the faith of Christ is not my will but yours be done. And that's so often what we need, the mindset, the mindset that we need to have. Because we look at things from our viewpoint. You know, April and I talk about this, this a lot with, 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 with things. April and I tend to be, anyhow, just when, when, when you help somebody, so often we want to help somebody from our perspective. When maybe we need to look at it, what help does that other person, what, what, what would be the most beneficial from that person's perspective? You know, and and that's kind of a little secular thing, but that's a, a change in thinking, right? Well, I want to help them in this manner because it makes me feel good, and there's nothing wrong with feeling good. I mean, there's some people that say, well, I know if I felt good, then I couldn't have been something that I did in the spirit. Well, that's not true. I mean, you, hopefully, if you do something in the spirit, you actually do feel really good about it ultimately, right? But but there's there's that mindset of looking at the, at a situation the way God looks at a situation, right? And even maybe not. That's right. You know, like I was reading a thing on Facebook where this guy has a his his white his daughter is black. I saw that. Yeah, and very interesting. And he was like, you know, she was trying to tell him, well, I can use the I can call blacks uh, the N word because I'm black, so that's okay. And like, you need to talk to her. A lot of people agree with him. Mm -hmm. Like this letter that this person sent him, like, no, it's either right or wrong. Who's the parent right. here? It doesn't matter whether your daughter's black or white. The teacher, the right thing. And mm -hmm. it may be uncomfortable. I remember a, a post was like, I bought a CD for my youngest daughter years ago, 15 years ago. She was a, a young teenager. She asked me for the CD for Christmas. Well, I didn't pay attention to the parental <laughs> warning on the CD, and I didn't listen to it, and I just gave it to her because she asked for it for Christmas. And several years later, I heard some of that CD because somebody else had gone like, ooh, what's that? And they told me what it was. It was some group called Limp Biscuit. And I, I was just, wow. oh, oh my God, I bought that CD for my daughter. What it, you know, and it's, wow. <laughs> and, and, and that's it, too. Kowtow to the kids. Look, right. Yeah. Let, you know, let everything be done for edification. Yeah. That's a pretty nice standard right there. If, if we were to look at things from an issue of, of edification, and we've said this, you know, a lot of times. Paul doesn't tell you when this happens, do this. He says, in, in a situation like this, this is what your attitude needs to be. Okay? Now, if this is your attitude, and it's the attitude that comes from the Holy Spirit renewing your spirit, what does the mind of Christ look like in this situation? And today might be different than the way you respond in five years, and they both might be in the will of God. But you See, need to know God's will. The will of know. God is not something you go out and find. The will of God is something that you carry with, with you. You are to apply the will of God in that situation in which you find yourself. You're not to go out and look for the will of God. The will of God is already clearly in the, in the written word of God here. 
What you need to do is apply that word of God in the situation of life where you find yourselves. And your situation, it, though it may look like mine, it might be completely different, and you might come with a different decision than I do, and they could both be 100% in the world will, in the will of God. If you ever notice, Paul doesn't give great detail on how to organize a church. He talks about bishops and deacons and whatnot because he, the Holy Spirit, he knows that in every situation, they're different. This was brought home to me. Apparently in Chicago, there were two mega churches back in Chicago, and they were going to go out and do some, some different uh, outreach programs. One, the pastor stood up and said, okay, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do this, and you're going to do that. The other one, somebody, the pastor stood up and said, okay, we need to have a committee, let's come together, I need some volunteers to do this, this, that, and this. They both were phenomenally successful in whatever the missionary was. Come to find out, the one pastor understood he had a bunch of blue-collar workers that were used to being told, do this, do that, do this, do that. The other church was very affluent as a bunch of people that were used to being in charge. So he could say, this is what we want to do, let's put together, and, and then... But that's, that's both of those people looking at the circumstances of life in their situation and applying the will of God to go out and do whatever they wanted to do. Now, you know, I, what, I don't know what the issue is. But, but that's the freedom, the liberty, as Paul uses it, that, that we have. But it comes from walking after the Spirit, right. not walking after the flesh. After the flesh, we're just going to stumble because we've seen the flesh and the Spirit. How often do they get along? They con they're they're contrary. contrary one to another. I said a couple of weeks ago, the reason people hate the Bible is it's negative towards man and positive towards God. And that whole the Spirit and the, and the flesh are contrary one to another, who do you think is the good guy in that and the bad guy? <laughs> the flesh is not the good one, okay? The spirit is the, is the good one in that, in that analogy there. Verse 6, Romans 8. You can see he's building the, this argument here, you know. Look at verse 1. There is therefore, and then 2. 4, verse 3. 4, verse 4. Verse four. That. He, he keeps building and building and building. So now he comes down to verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life, life and, and peace. death. Life and peace. Life and peace. Carnal, that would pertain to the flesh, fleshly, sensual, sensual, opposed to spiritual, uh, being in the natural state, unregenerate, things like that. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When you're thinking about things, again, he's talking to believers here. When you're talking about thing, thinking about things in your flesh, it results death. Now, the death is the death of Romans 7, that functional death where Paul couldn't be used the way he was supposed to be being used. For God. Walking after the Spirit, minding the things of the Spirit, though, results in life, functional life, and peace. And peace. Now, compare the peace to the no condemnation of verse 1 to the O wretched man that I am of Romans 7.24. When you are going, oh, wretched man that I am, is there peace in your life? No. No, you feel terrible. You want to fix that situation immediately, don't you? At least I do. April tells me every day, oh, you wretched man. <laughs> what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? Come with me. If you hold a hand here, come with me to Philippians 4. This just came to mind. I'm sorry, what's the reference? Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. No matter what's going on in your life, you can rejoice in the Lord. Verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, when he says be careful for nothing, he's, he's, he's not saying, hey, just have a willy-nilly attitude towards life and don't think of it. He says, don't get so wrapped up in those cares. Don't get so burdensome. Share your burden. Right? In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. We're going to see in a few verses, not today, but um, in Romans 8, he says, we don't know how to pray for as we ought. Now, all the way over here in Philippians, he says, you know what? Make sure you bring everything to God. Bring everything to God. Now, what can you expect when you, by prayer and supplication, 
With thanksgiving, don't miss that. Yep. Let your request be made known unto God. The peace of the God. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So there's walking after the Spirit. You want to know how walking after the Spirit results so you get this peace that he's talking about over here in Romans 5? Well, it starts with bring all your prayers, all your supplications with thanksgiving to the Lord. Share them with the Lord. Yep. And he promises that the peace of God, that's what that's what the answer to that prayer will be. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, the, after he says that, now look what he goes on to say. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, Think on these things. You know what he's doing here in Philippians versus what he was doing in Romans 7 and 8? He's minding the things of the Spirit now. He's thinking on the things of the Spirit. And then verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, one word, do, do and the God of peace shall be with you. If you want to know if what you're doing is right, it should agree with Paul's epistles. That's what that verse says. He says, those things which you have learned, received, and heard, and seen in Paul, Paul is our example, Paul is our pattern, do those things. And he summarized. We're not living the grace lifestyle. Walking after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Living under grace, not under the law. And then he sums it up in one little word. Do. The things you've seen and heard from me, do those things. And the result will be, the God of peace shall be with you. To be spiritually minded is what? A functional love and peace. Now, are you still going to have problems in your life? Absolutely. So Corinthians tells us we'll be able to bear it, be able to escape it. That is, bear it. Not escape, run away, but it's, we're going to bear it because we have the peace of God in our mind, right? Isn't, when you go through tribulation and struggles, isn't that what you want? You just want your mind to slow down for just a second? Just a second, sometimes it seems like. But we don't have to be full of cares that we think about this. The creator of the universe has just told you, if you bring everything to me, I'll help you. The being with so much power that he spoke and everything became says, you know what, Dave? If you'll just share that little that, that, that issue in your life with me, we can, we can develop some peace for you. Now, is there a situation that still needs to be fixed? Yeah, probably. But if you can get your mind to slow down and think about it, mm -hmm. this is just like the issues of forgiveness. Right? You should forgive other people. Somebody once said, if you're never wrong, you don't have an op you don't have the opportunity to forgive people. So you should thank them for wronging you. <laughs> but think about it. If nobody ever wronged you, 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 you wouldn't have the opportunity to put into place that verse, right? Now, we get around with this weird idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean staying in a bad situation. It does not mean being codependent or any of those things. But there's a spiritual issue. The verse says, forgive others as Christ forgave you. No matter what somebody did to you, it wasn't as bad as what you did for Jesus, to Jesus Christ. That That's ended right. up with him dying on the cross for your sins. Yeah. Now, maybe you forgive somebody and you never have nothing to do with them. That's all. Uh, there's a very clear do doctrine of separation in Paul's epistles as well. But there's where you take the written word of God, understand the total, complete, 100% unconditional forgiveness that you have, apply it in your life, and when you forgive somebody the way Christ forgave you, what goes away? Bitterness, judgmentalism. Maybe if, if, if you could, maybe you're just spending all your wasted time thinking about that person or that issue. I mean. I know I spent a lot of time giving it to somebody in my mind. What if I just forgive them and move on in front of them somebody I never have to deal with again anyway? Again, what are we talking about? Walking after the Spirit. Because like April says, we love to forgive people once we get our pound of flesh. Right? We'll be more than happy to forgive, but let me get me a little first. Then I'll forgive you. Jesus never said that to you. Verse 7, Romans 8. So to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why is that? 
because the carnal enmity is carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then the bear and the flesh cannot please God. Right. Now verse seven and eight clearly, clearly can apply to an unsaved person. Do we not? You see that in the verse, right? If you have a carnal mind, I mean, a person that's not saved can't please God. Right. Right. And they are an enemy. Romans 5 tells us that we were God's enemy when he yeah. died. For you us. have to be in Christ. Right. Okay. But again, he's talking to believers here. Because the carnal mind, fleshly thinking, thinking about me, about my flesh, how I can do this, is enmity against God. It's not subject to those eyes, and it can't be. That word enmity. Quality of being an enemy. It's an interesting way to, to put it. Ill will, hatred, or a state of opposition. Again, that's just the flesh and the spirit are contrary one to another. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul spends a lot of time saying the same things in different ways to drive the point home. The issue is not our flesh, the issue is walking after the spirit. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. God, we'll, we'll stop there. Clearly, if you're not saved, you can't please God. But he's talking about a saved person walking according to the flesh, no matter how good their intentions, cannot please God. This is one of those verses, there's no loophole. If you're walking in the flesh, you can't please God. And we don't want to think that way. I understand. We want to think that our intentions are so good mm -hmm. that they would be the right thing. And you know what? I might even say that. The issue is walking after the Spirit. Right. What does the mind of Christ look like in this situation in which I find myself? Now, most of the circumstances we find ourselves in life are usually two or three second things that we don't see coming. I mean, the, the, you know, you holidays and you get together with the family, you know you got to deal with Crazy Aunt Cindy. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Crazy Aunt Liz, that's my sister. Uh, uh, and, and you can, or how about Crazy Uncle Dave? You can prepare for that kind of stuff, right? But the stuff that happens instantaneously on the freeway, in the grocery store, somebody's wearing a mask, somebody's not wearing their mask. Those kinds of things that happen that quick, you don't have to, okay, well, now, wait, just have to wait, wait, wait. Let me see what the Bible would say about that. It, it's a maturity level. It's having your senses exercised to discern good and evil. So that it just is who you are. This maturity, you grow up, you had your, sexes, your, your senses exercised. You can determine good and evil in a situation. So when something happens, you, boom, and immediately, you just, you make the right decision. Because that's who you are. Because the Spirit's working in you. Because your, your inner man's being renewed day by day. Well, that makes me think of Philippians 4, where you're talking about the mind of Christ, where then you go over and uh, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever right. things we are lovely. With, verse, yeah. Those are things of how, how Jesus Christ thinks. Right. If you were to study out Philippians 4 there, those things he said to think about, you, will, you, can, you can find uh, all those terms applied to the Word of God. And all those terms apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. If you ever have a rainy Sunday afternoon with nothing to do. Which is every day. <laughs> get your get your Bible and go take those words and you will find that you can apply them to the Word of God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what should you be thinking about? The Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the football game. Not the next trip. Not the stuff that needs to be done in the motor home or in the yard. You should be thinking about that stuff. And I, yeah, I understand this. I live in the same world everybody else does. And, and we like to think our flesh is so much better than it really is. And it's not. And I find it, you know, I, I, I find it, I, I look back at the situation and I think, well, yeah, I think I sure handled that well. And I get away back and I think, boy, I, should, I, I didn't handle that well. Yeah. I, you know, I was so sure that, that I, 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 I won't even say that I was right, but I, that, I, that I handled that that well. And you look back and you know, it would have been, there was, there was, that was my flesh handling. If I if I handled it according to what the Word of God says, I would have handled it this way. I used to hear this expression that my parents would say: "The road to hell is paved with good intentions." Right. <laughs> the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Absolutely, absolutely. Why is that? Because you're because doing, we're doing it in the flesh. Our flesh. 
We do it in our flesh. And we've seen today, I've said it a bunch of different ways. Paul has said it a bunch of different ways. The spirit and the flesh are contrary one to another. So that you cannot do the things that you would. And that's exactly what happened when we saw it. Paul looked at himself in Romans 7. And the ultimate end of that was what? Oh, oh wretched, wretched man, man that I am. Because I tried to please God, I failed. So I tried a little harder, I failed again. Try a little, and then he goes, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? Again, that, that's, that's not death like physical death in the situation. It's, 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 it's the death, the functional death. That he's just not being able to be used for who he should be. And he's in the middle of his ministry at this point in time. Don't forget, this happened to Paul in his ministry. This is not when he was well into it at some point. I don't know the exact time, but he says, I was alive without the law once. So that's after his salvation on the road to Damascus. He was going good, and then he put himself back under the law, and he says he died. Yep. In Paul's own life, he, he Paul's our pattern. And in his own life, he gives you this very intimate, personal retrospective about how I tried to walk after the flesh, and it did not work. Just weren't in guilt and everything. So now he writes, tells us all about Romans 8 and the, the wonderful life we have when we get to meet the third person of the Godhead, if you will, the Holy Spirit. I think Paul only mentions the Spirit one time before he gets to Romans 8. And now it, it just, Romans 8, you can't miss the Holy Spirit. That's a whole issue there. How does that happen? It's not a metaphysical thing that happens up in there. When you read the Word of God rightly divided, the Holy Spirit teaches you lessons here. You make a decision in your mind to believe what you your mind has, has, has been renewed to instead of believing the body of sin that's already was crucified with him and been cut off. Why would you follow something? Why would I follow something that's already been cut off when I have this? It's so much better. This is a body. Of, this body of sin, he never says anything good about that body of sin. That's right. Over here, our spirit was dead, but now it's alive. Righteousness, holiness, liberty. We looked at this. It's life and peace. Life and peace. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the love that you have for us. We do thank you that you've given us your spirit inside of us to, to walk after and that you've given us your word, your complete, perfect, inerrant word where we can learn what it means to walk after the spirit. We can look at a situation the way you would look at a situation. We don't have to guess at how you would look at it. You've already told us. We just need to study it and believe what the verse is saying. My prayer for all of us, Lord, is that we, we just, all of us, want to just believe that our flesh is so much better than it is and we'll, that we would just come to an understanding we can go off not after our flesh, not according to our own desires, our own thoughts, our own conclusions, but after the Spirit. And again, how do, how do we walk after the Spirit? We study your word, understand how you look at situations so that we would look at situations in the same manner as it says in Hebrews that our senses would be exercised through the regular use and application of your word to the situations of life. We do thank you for your love. We do thank you for your grace. And we do thank you that you promised to do this work in us if we'll just get our own flesh out of the way first. We give you thanks and praise in all things, Lord. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Okie dokie.